Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Leonie. I am a huge book nerd and a huge fan of romance and this is another episode of Leonie analyzes things that nobody asked for and that definitely do not need to be analyzed as much with today's useless topic being fake dating. <laughs> so I've consumed my fair share of fake dating media books and movies. I really love it and today I just want to talk about when is it done well? How can it be done very not well? And also just answer the question, why do we like this trope so much? And we'll also be ranking some very popular fake dating storylines on how ridiculous their setups actually are. Now, why are we talking about this? If anywhere in the last year you have walked into a bookstore, you've probably come across a little table with a little cute little stand made by the bookshop owners with book talk books or TikTok book recommendations. Especially romance books have been doing really great online lately because apparently we are all starved for anything with a little bit of spice. Now here are some of the books that have been pretty popular over the past year. Not even just on TikTok, also everywhere else. And when I say everywhere else, I mean everywhere else on the internet because I am chronically online. Anyway, all of these garnered between like 60k and 700k reads on Goodreads. For context, Conversations with Friends, a book that has been out for five years and has a TV show made out of it, has 200k reads in total on Goodreads. So these books are popular. What do all these books have in common? Wow, you guessed it correctly. I'm so proud of you. You definitely didn't infer from the title of this video and the topic. It's fake dating. Side note, not gonna lie, I really thought that the fake dating trope was more popular than it is. I really thought every romance book coming out in the last year was like fake dating, but from the nominees of the Romance Goodreads Award in 2021, only 4 out of 20 were fake dating. So apparently it's not as common as I thought that it was, but I guess the ones that do have fake dating just really blow up and become very popular. So fake dating, we have two people, they probably don't really like each other, but they both have a problem in their life that really could be solved by being in a relationship. So out of all of the options, out of all of the things that you could do in the situations, the character decide, obviously, the best solution here is to fake a relationship. <laughs> and it's amazing, I love it. I'm really excited to do another discussion video. I've done discussion videos in the past. Uh, this one's not as well structured as those. I just wanted to have a fun conversation, but I promise in the future we will have more structured and even more discussion videos once I am freed from the shackles that is getting my neuroscience degree. Speaking of neuroscience degrees, you know who also has a neuroscience degree? Ali Hazelwood, the author of The Love Hypothesis. And this would have been a really great segue right now, but unfortunately we're not going to be talking about the love hypothesis until later in the video. Let's start with the anatomy of fake dating. How does the trope work? How do couples usually go from fake dating to real dating? In order to explore the general anatomy of a fake dating storyline, I want to look at a case study, a prime example of <laughs> Just basically, I just want to talk about one of my favorite episodes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. <laughs> this episode contains fake dating and I think it's a perfect example of just all the beats that a fake dating should have, right? So Brooklyn Nine-Nine is a TV show about cops and two co-workers, Jake and Amy, are in a rivalry with each other. They really don't like each other, so of course we ship them. They are actually kind of into each other, but of course they would never admit that to each other. Really the only thing standing between them kissing is their own big ego. But in one episode they are on a mission to spy on this big bad guy together. And the big bad guy goes into a fancy restaurant. So Jake and Amy have to go into this restaurant so they can continue spying on him. Unfortunately, the restaurant is full, so they have to pretend to be a newlywed couple in order to convince the hostess 
to give them a table. Cue fake dating step number one, which is the classic scene where someone asks them, oh, why are you, how did you get married? Like, what do you guys like so much about each other? And these two people who have only expressed their strong dislike for each other so far have to start saying nice things about each other. And of course they start saying things that they genuinely mean. Later in the episode, the big bad guy is in a park, probably doing shady stuff, and they're still spying on him. But when the big bad guy looks around, they don't want to seem too suspicious. Like, what are two people randomly doing in a park? So, in order to not seem suspicious, they have to kiss. Don't question it, okay? They just... It's romance logic. <laughs> and ooh, they kiss and they're kind of into it kind of into it. So via the vague dating plotline, they both realize that they're actually more into each other than they thought. They also show each other a little bit of the feelings that they have, which they never would have done without the fake dating scenario because showing your feelings for something is scary. And this is how usually two characters go from fake dating to real dating. One of the biggest part of the fake dating trope is the setup. Because why? on earth would two people decide to pretend to be in a relationship with each other and lie to everyone around them? In romance logic, it usually doesn't take that much to get to that conclusion. <laughs> so what I find so funny about fake dating and the whole setup is this collective acceptance. We've all just collectively accepted that although we know that this is not something people do in real life, it's, it's normal in books. We don't really question it. It's just something that characters and real humans alike have all just accepted. Fake dating, that's just something that can happen regularly and is a very normal solution to problems sometimes. It's ridiculous and that's what I love about it, so I thought it would be fun to take a look at some well-known fake dating books and movies and take a look at the setup for their fake dating and then rank them based on how ridiculous that setup would be in real life. And this also really works as giving you recommendations for fake dating stories and also it's a great way to give you a bit of a synopsis of some of the books that we'll be talking about later. You know, you see how this is all, wow, it's like a great setup for the rest of the video. Wow, this is a very, very well thought out video. <laughs> so we have a list of some popular books and movies that completely revolve around the fake dating story. The example I just gave with Brooklyn Nine-Nine is how the trope is often incorporated into non-romance genres, so in fantasy or just like comedy. Usually the fake dating is something that's only a small part of the story, like it'll come up in maybe one episode as like a fun little plot point for that episode. But in romance books and movies, it's usually the entire plot revolves around the fake dating trope and that's what we'll be talking about. So I have I've created a few tiers for their setups. At the top we have would actually consider like I would actually do this myself. <laughs> then we have ridiculous but cute I'll accept it. Why would you agree to this? Um, blame it on the parents. Why communicate when you can be petty? That's the bread and butter of fake dating romances. And uh, lastly restraining order. First up, we have Written in the Stars. We follow Darcy and Elle. Um, complete opposites. Elle's an astrology girl and Darcy is more of a, a cool, strict, black and white wearing type A person. They were set up on a date by Darcy's brother, who is also Elle's business partner. And although the date went horribly wrong, Darcy's family was so happy that Darcy was finally, finally had someone to date that Darcy convinces Elle um, to continue the fake relationship just to make the parents happy. So this is a very clear example of the very common setup, which is just blame it on the parents. Just easy like that. And for a movie, we have The Duff. I don't know if anyone remembers this movie. The setup is very similar to the book The Deal by L. Kennedy, but I haven't read that one. And it's we have the unpopular girl and the popular guy who strike a deal that she will help him with his homework if he fake dates her so she can 
increase her popularity and her social capital. Which is, of course, absolutely ridiculous, but I'm gonna say it's kind of cute because it's clearly both people are getting something out of this. And also they're teenagers, so I'll give them a little bit more leeway for being stupid. Then let's go with She Drives Me Crazy, which is a YA book. The romance between the cheerleader and the jock girl. We love the opposites attract. Basically, the reason for them to start fake dating is because our jock girl wants to make her ex girlfriend <laughs> jealous. Because she's not really over her ex. And, you know, why communicate when you can just be petty? and make people jealous. The Unhoneymooners by Christina Lauren. Okay, how do I explain this one? So Olive's sister is getting married, but unfortunately the couple cannot go on their honeymoon because they get extremely sick at the wedding. So the only people at the wedding that didn't get sick are our main character Olive and her, her nemesis, Ethan. So they get the opportunity to go on this all-inclusive luxury honeymoon together. The only catch is that, of course, they have to convince everyone at the resort that they are the people on the ticket and they really are the newlywed couple that is supposed to be there. Now, although I would always say that fake dating is a bad idea in real life, this I would do. No doubt in my mind, I would 100% do this. Honestly, when I was reading this book, I did not understand why Olive was making such a big deal out of this. I don't care if I hate someone. I will gladly pretend to be married with you if I can just go on an all-expenses-paid-for-free, all-inclusive resort holiday. Oh, let's do another very famous one. To All the Boys I've Loved Before, which was a YA book originally, but of course has been turned into the Netflix show with our favorite fake dating guy, Noah Centineo. Our main character accidentally sends a letter to her sister's ex-boyfriend um, that she used to have a crush on him, which is of course extremely awkward. So in order to convince him that she's not actually into him anymore, she, of course, needs to be in a relationship. And she does so with Peter, who also wants to be in a relationship to make his ex-girlfriend jealous. So this is a double case of the why just communicate about your feelings when you can be petty about it. Uh, let's talk about the love hypothesis. Um, do you have some time to strap in? Because this is, this is quite the extravagant setup. So we follow Olive, another Olive. A PhD student at Stanford. So Olive's friend has a crush on Olive's ex, which Olive is completely okay with, but her friend just keeps thinking that she can't make a move or do something about it because she keeps thinking that Olive actually does have a problem with it. So in order to convince her friend that she is definitely completely okay with her dating her ex, she decides to talk to her friend about it? No. Of course not. Silly. Why would you think that? She decides she needs to be in a fake relationship. <laughs> because if her friend sees that she's in a relationship, she might finally truly be convinced that Olive will be okay with her dating her ex. So in order to choose said fake relationship, Olive decides to just kiss the first man she sees and that will be her fake relationship. <laughs> this turns out to be Adam, her senior researcher at the Stanford lab, who agrees to fake dating a PhD student because he has trouble getting grand money from Stanford because Stanford is afraid that Adam will leave for Harvard. So Adam thinks if I'm in a relationship, they will think I'm settling down and not leave for Harvard, so they'll give me the grant money. Restraining order. Then we have the kiss quotient. The setup for this story is that our main character has no experience with relationships and sex and doesn't want to go into the dating life without any experience. So she hires an escort, like she basically pays him to pretend to be in a relationship with her and do relationshipy things so she can practice. And that's the setup, which is absolutely ridiculous, but just a very cute romantic setup, I think. The Spanish love deception. 
This is another case of our main character has to go to Spain to, I think, her sister's wedding. And she somehow convinced her parents that she has a date because they keep nagging to her that she needs to have a date. And for some reason, her co-worker, who she hates, agrees to this to come with her. So, yes, it's blame on the parents, but I think this is an excellent example of... Why would you agree to this? There's clear motive on one side, but on the other side, it's just why would you do this? Like there we lacking in we are lacking in motive. Now another one that I put here as an example of another blame it on the parents is the holidays. <laughs> the Christmas movie where two people who meet at a mall just decide to be each other's fake dates for holidays just to ease their parents' anxiety about them having a relationship. So we can blame it on the parents. Famous movie, The Proposal, a boss, played by Sandra Bullock, forces her employee to fake marry her. No, to real marry her. So she can keep her visa and stay in the US. Restraining order. I think they actually could go to jail for this. I'm pretty sure that's legal. <laughs> Great movie, though. <laughs> and then last but not least, we have Take a Hint, Danny Brown. In this one, Danny and Zarif at first don't actively decide to go fake dating. It's just that a photo of them blows up on the internet and everyone ships them. And they decide, hey, actually, this internet clout, maybe we should play into it. Because Zarif notices that all this internet clout around this supposed relationship between them two really helps him with fundraising for his sports charity. And Danny agrees to continue the fake dating. Another one where I'm like, very great motive on Zarif's side. Didn't really fully understand why Danny would agree to this. Okay, and that is my, that is my ranking of all the, all the weird kinds of setups that fake dating storylines can have. So before I move on to my theory on what I think makes the fake dating trope so popular, I want to make a little, a little detour, a little quick side note. Because I think there are two things that make the fake dating trope so popular, but there is a subset of fake dating storylines that don't have these two things that I'll be talking about. And because of that, these this subset of fake dating storylines are also less likely to real into bad territory. And it is fake dating without the forced romantic scenes. So no fake kissing and realizing they're actually into it. Um, no forced being nice to each other. No forced touching each other and getting all flustered. None of that. Those aspects are not present in this subset of fake dating. And this subset of fake dating completely relies on the forced proximity that comes with it. Forced proximity is, is another romance trope where it's basically, well, the two characters are forced to be in each other's proximity. <laughs> Usually two people that don't like each other are forced to spend a lot of time together. That's the forced proximity. And because of that, you get a lot of scenes with them together and they slowly fall for each other, right? And there are some fake dating storylines that pretty much solely rely on this on the forced proximity that comes with fake dating of course but don't give you all the like forced romantic scenes between two characters it's kind of like a high risk high reward thing <laughs> where it's like like the more forced romantic scenes like the higher the likelihood of the story becoming really bad. Example of this subset of fake dating, I think is She Drives Me Crazy. In She Drives Me Crazy, we follow a jock basketball girl um, and a cheerleader, which of course makes them natural enemies. Like I explained during the ranking, they start fake dating uh, mostly because the jock girl wants to make her ex jealous. The fake dating really only means that they end up spending a lot of time together. I think the most forced romantic scene is that they have to change in the same room. That's the only thing I can think of. And through spending so much time together and going on dates together, they get to know each other and they overcome the prejudices that they have for each other. And that's how they fall in love. So it's a little more um, focus on, I guess, the natural progression of their romantic relationship and not as much forced sexual tension. But with that out of the way, most 
fake dating storylines do include these forced romantic scenes between characters to really like amp up the sexual tension between them. And let's talk about that. My theory, <laughs> why fake dating stories are so effective and why we love them so much. Uh, and that is because in fake dating storylines allows the characters to bypass the two things, two stages in romance and seduction that usually our society deems a little awkward and preferably skippable, and that is vulnerability and consent. Let's start with vulnerability. Now, usually in real life, when you're about to kiss someone or you're about to ask someone out on a date, you have to go through a very vulnerable moment, and that is showing the other person that you're kind of into them. Either because you're going in for a kiss or you're literally about to ask them out. And that moment is vulnerable. Ew. It's scary because what if they don't like you back? Then you've just admitted to someone that you like someone and you feel like a loser. Admitting that you have positive feelings about someone? Cringe. Anyway, I think that is why fake dating often seems like such an attractive idea because you can always hide yourself behind the fake dating. You can just flirt freely without having to be vulnerable because, you know, it was just fake dating. It wasn't real. If the other person turns out to not be into it, well, you can just say like, it's, it was fake. It was fake. It wasn't real. Also, from a narrative perspective, this is very interesting because it postpones the ultimate vulnerable moment like you know as a reader that in the end of course they're going to end up liking each other and there's going to be this vulnerable moment at some point in the story where they do have to tell each other it was real for me you know and then they find out that the feeling is actually mutual and the tension is relieved right you know in the end the two characters are gonna have to be vulnerable and admit that they're into each other how things usually go in a romance story is that Throughout the entire book or movie, the characters don't know from each other that they're into each other and there's this tension buildup between them. And then towards the end, they find out their feelings are mutual and the tension is relieved, right? And usually in a movie or a book, you don't really get to see the characters be together and be cute and do relationshipy things with each other because at this point... The tension has already been relieved. There's no will they, won't they anymore. There's no tension buildup anymore because both of the characters already know that they're into each other. We don't want to watch a fully functioning relationship. But the fake dating plotline is a fantastic loophole for this because you can have two characters do relationshipy stuff and be cute together all while retaining the tension buildup and retaining this will they won't they because they haven't passed the being vulnerable and actually admitting that they're into each other stage yet. And I think that's why fake dating just works really well for romance stories. So we know that fake dating allows the characters to bypass the vulnerability moment. The other thing that I think uh, fake dating allows the characters to bypass is the consent stage. If you think of romance stories, we love sweeping scenes of characters just in the moment deciding to kiss each other, out of the blue giving in to their desires, characters insisting that they're not into each other, but actually they are. Rarely in media will there be a moment where the characters actually take a moment to consider if the other person actually also wants the thing that they want aka ask for consent. And unfortunately, we live in a society where the message people need to ask for consent more is usually met with, but that will kill the mood. No, Ben, you just have no game. Now, in fake dating, it's also super easy to kind of conveniently bypass this consent stage, bypass the moment you have to kill the mood to ask for consent. Examples of how this can be done well later. And in order to keep up this illusion of the relationship, the characters can usually just do anything to each other at any moment, usually under the guise of it'll benefit the moment. And it's not just that, it's not just that the characters don't ask for consent. Because the fake dating often happens in public, it even goes so far that the characters can often 
not reasonably say no to something without shattering the illusion of the relationship and outing themselves as a liar to all of their friends and family. And this is why I think fake dating would be absolutely horrible in real life, because you're creating an environment where people cannot reasonably say no to advancement that make them uncomfortable. So please, please just don't do fake dating in real life. <laughs> please just don't. I don't think people are doing it that often, but if you're, if you, if anyone's considering it, don't, just don't. However, of course, we're talking about fiction, not real life. And usually when you're reading a book, you can clearly tell both characters are kind of into it. You can clearly tell because you're reading their thoughts that none, none of the involved people are actually uncomfortable and want to say no, but can't. Usually they're both secretly really into it, so no one's doing things that they're uncomfortable with. Usually. So this, for me, is a breaking point of whether I'll like or dislike a fake dating romance. Because fake dating, if done wrong, can be a breeding ground for just uncomfortable murky consent situations. Example, I want to illustrate this by talking about the love hypothesis. Because although this is an extremely popular fake dating romance, I did not like this partially because of this. So I want to give an example. So the love hypothesis, you may remember, follows Olive, a PhD student, fake dating a senior researcher called Adam. This book includes a lot of those forced romantic moments in public, in front of all their co-workers, because they have to convince all the co-workers that they're in a relationship. Forced situations that they get themselves into include, and I guess these are mild spoilers for the book, having to rub him in with sunscreen publicly at, at a park outing with, with work, and also sitting on his lap publicly during a conference because there were no seats available anymore. And another important detail is that never do Adam and Olive decide to do this. Every case, it is her friend that kind of forces them into these situations and is like, you should do this. You should rub his naked upper body in with sunscreen right in front of all of your co-workers. <laughs> so this is not Olive and Adam's own initiative. They are forced into these situations. We are only in Olive's perspective. And to me, at least as a reader, it was completely unclear if Adam was okay with this. And he definitely was not in the situation that he could refuse because, like I mentioned before, that would shatter the illusion to all of their co-workers and it would out them as weird liars. When I was reading these scenes, I wanted to eat my own shoe because of the secondhand embarrassment that I felt. Part of me was like, I know that they're both into it because this is a romance novel and that's how this works and they're always both into it. Just knowing that if they weren't into it, that would be like the most horrible, awkward, uncomfortable situation imaginable. And to me, that ruins the book. Okay. This is what I mean with the high risk, high reward scale. You have forced romantic situations, which, which could lead to some really tense scenes, but very easily could go completely astray. And to me, that's an example of it going completely astray because of the lack of consent. Now, it can be done well. For me, an example of this is take a hint, Danny Brown. The one wears a reef and Danny do fake dating <laughs> for internet clout, basically. And the reason is because there are a lot of romantic scenes between them that don't happen in public. So there's already this establishment of, hey, this is happening between us right now. It's not fake. And also you can reasonably say no without ruining it for both of us. And I really wish I had the book with me, unfortunately I don't have access to the physical book because otherwise I would look up the specific scene for you. It was a scene between the two sitting together 
in public so other people would see them, but the conversation that they had would not be heard by other people. So they could technically talk about anything and say anything to each other they want. Zarif tells Danny what he would like to do to her. And then if I remember correctly, he asks her what she would do if he did those things. To which Danny, of course, responds positively. So that was a good example of how you can establish consent within the fake dating where it doesn't become too murky. Also, Tali Hibbert books are just really good and you should read them. <laughs> the other problem with the tricky consent situation around fake dating is that it often can lead to just horrible miscommunication. This to me is another one of those breaking points for whether I think the fake dating is done well or not and that is does the fake dating situation lead to miscommunication? Here I want to give an example of another very popular fake dating book that I did not like and that is the Spanish Love Deception and I specifically want to talk about a scene that happens late in the book that just made me want to pull my teeth out because of the miscommunication. A refresher, we have Catalina and Aaron who are going to Spain <laughs> for a wedding and Catalina has convinced her parents that she's in a relationship just to get them to shut up and Aaron went with her to be her fake relationship even though they don't really like each other. So we have these two characters that have established with each other that they're in a fake dating relationship and that they're both trying to convince everyone that they are in a relationship. Now. At the wedding, I'm pretty sure this is at the wedding. I don't quite remember. It's an event. <laughs> there is a kiss cam that's going around the crowd. Of course, Catalina and Aaron are together because, you know, they're supposed to be a couple. No one's really paying attention to them. They can freely talk to each other. But of course, they're aware that if the kiss cam ends on them, they need to kiss in front of everyone. Now, cue an extremely long scene of Catalina getting extremely anxious over the fact that this kiss cam might end up on their faces. And it's just page after page of her worrying about what she should do. Can she kiss him? Would he be okay with that? Would he not be okay with that? Should she just do it? Or would it shatter the illusion if she doesn't do it? Should she go all in? Or would it be okay to just give a quick peck on the mouth? All of these worries. And I'm like, girl, He's standing next to you. You both are aware that this is an arrangement that you have. You you could ask him. You could you could very easily just lean over and be like, "Hey, if it ends on us, do we just give a quick kiss on the cheek maybe?" Ask him. But no, because good communication that's not interesting. Who does that? <laughs> and that's what I mean when I say that with fake dating, authors can very easily just lean on miscommunication for more drama in the plot. Uh, but I think it's just annoying and not well written. So like the previous two things, you know, being able to skip the vulnerability and the consent part is just us humans um, <laughs> not being good at communicating. <laughs> but the last thing that I think makes a fake dating so popular is something a little more wholesome and that is that it almost always goes together with overcoming prejudice. It's not exclusive to fake dating. It is a very common and almost integral part to any fake dating romance. It, it has to do with the forced proximity thing. You know, you have two characters that usually they start out not getting along because otherwise the fake dating isn't as interesting. You have two characters that don't really get along. They have to fake date therefore spend a lot of time with each other, do a lot of cutesy things together, maybe kiss, maybe they kiss. <laughs> and then through that they learn to love each other, which means they have to overcome their prejudices for each other. Uh, and I like this because overcoming prejudices almost always goes together with character growth. And that's why I think it's, it always, it just always works really well. Conclusion, fake dating. I love it. <laughs> it's a fun narrative loophole that makes it possible for two characters to go through the cutesy romantic things that couples do while still retaining the will they won't they tension throughout the story. It can very easily lead to very horrible consent situations. So again, please 
for the love of all that is good and holy, do not do this in real life. But a good fake dating story, in my opinion, establishes good consent rules and also does not rely on the miscommunication for drama. Thank you to the people on the Purple Time Discord, that's the name of our Discord, that gave their opinion when I asked for insight uh, for this video topic. So if you also want to be there when I ask for input on another discussion topic, and also if you just want to have a place to talk to other book lovers about all kinds of things and books that you've read, you can join the Purple Time Discord. Subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this video and want to see more book content. And also you can follow me on my social media at the Booklio everywhere. Like I said, I don't usually do these types of discussion videos because um, I often don't really have the time to make them, but I really wanted to make this one. I had a lot of fun. So let me know if you'd like to see more of this. And... I think that's it. Thank you for watching. I'm really glad that you were here and I will see you in another video soon. Goodbye.